cspan.org. Now here's a look at our programming for the next several hours. Next, Wednesday's House Rules Committee hearing on ethics reform procedures. Followed by President Clinton on the proposed tobacco lawsuit settlement. And more on the tobacco settlement on this morning's Washington Journal with guest John Schwartz of the Washington Post. And at 10 a.m., live coverage of the U.S. House. Next, a hearing on the House ethics process. The House Rules Committee Wednesday heard testimony from members of Congress about a new ethics system proposed by a bipartisan task force. The task force was formed in January following a two-year investigation of ethics complaints against House Speaker Newt Gingrich. The Rules Committee will ultimately decide which amendments to the proposed new system will be offered on the House floor. Congressman Gerald Solomon of New York chairs this one hour and 45 minute hearing. The <coughs> committee will uh, come to order. Uh, the measure before the Rules Committee today is House Resolution 168, which implements the recommendations of the bipartisan House Ethics Reform Task Force. I want to begin this hearing by commending the two co-chairmen of this uh, bipartisan task force, uh, Mr. Cardin and, uh, and the uh, chairman of the uh, Appropriations Committee, Mr. Livingston. The gentleman from Louisiana and the gentleman from Maryland have put in long hours negotiating every word and every phrase in the resolution before the Rules Committee today, and I mean every word and every phrase. We are grateful to them for their work. The Ethics Reform uh, Task Force was bipartisan, consisting of six Republicans and six Democrats. Those of us who served on the task force, including myself, uh, four members of the Rules Committee, can attest that all of the task force members put in long hours of hearings and markup sessions over a period of months. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, Mr. Moakley, uh, the ranking member of the Rules Committee, and Mr. Frost, and uh, uh, incidentally, Mr. Goss, who was uh, called back to Florida uh, because of uh, uh, a serious illness in his family and unfortunately can't be here uh, with us today. And uh, uh, that's too bad because Porter put in such uh, a lot of work both on the uh, Ethics Committee with you, Ben, and, uh, and on the task force itself. Uh, having said that, the House established this task force back in February uh, of this year in order to recommend reforms in the House standard process. There are many of us who feel that the existing process did not function well in the last Congress and needs improvement, particularly in trying to remove the, uh, the politics from the Ethics Committee. It's a very, very serious matter. At the same time this task force was established, the House also approved a moratorium on the filing of new ethics complaints, which as a result of the number of extensions remained in effect until uh, September 10th, I think, 1997. And as I understand uh, that the two co-chairmen may have a bipartisan manager's amendment to make it clear that any complaints that are filed after September 10th, but before the adoption of this resolution, will be considered under the new procedures in this resolution. Turn off that machine there. Friend. As we begin this hearing, there are a couple of points that should be made about the functions of the Committee on Standards of Official Conduct. First, the Committee is not a court of law. Members of Congress, like any other citizens, are already answerable in the courts for any violation of the law, uh, particularly uh, since uh, a law that we passed uh, back in uh, the beginning of 1995, which brings members of Congress and all of this Congress under all of the laws that the rest of the American citizens have to live under. The Committee on Standards of Official Conduct, um, the Ethics Committee, uh, better known, is a peer review mechanism. The United States Constitution, in Article I, provides that each House may punish its members for disorderly behavior, and with the concurrence of two-thirds, they may even expel a member, which I, they have done on other occasions. I would like to emphasize that the Constitution says that each House may punish its members. It does not say that some outside group will punish members. It should also be noted that the House of Representatives Code of Official Conduct sets a higher standard than just conforming to the laws. For example, under the Code of Conduct, 
a member, an officer, or an employee of the House of Representatives shall conduct himself or herself at all times in a manner which shall reflect credibility on this House of Representatives that we are all so, so privileged to serve in. And the Committee on the Standards of Official Conduct is the mechanism by which members should hold themselves to that higher standard. We should set the example, I think, for the rest of society. The resolution which is before the Rules Committee today is a somewhat controversial matter. Members have different opinions, and they hold those opinions very strongly. Uh, we need to remember to respect those opinions of other members, even as we disagree. Sometimes that's hard to do when you're very opinionated, and I guess I'm, I'm one of those members. Uh, now, if my colleague uh, on the minority side uh, has an opening statement, I'd be pleased to recognize him, after which we will certainly uh, go to the testimony of these very, very uh, distinguished uh, members of this, uh, this House of Representatives. Mr. Moakley. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm very glad that this committee is finally considering the hard work of the bipartisan ethics task force, and I very much hope that I won't be disappointed in the outcome. As you all know, nine months ago, Mr. Chairman, you, Mr. Frost, Mr. Goss, and I, along with eight other people, began work on the Ethics Task Force. We had at least 36 meetings, and every single one of us negotiated on very important issues. Because all of us, Democrats and Republicans alike, thought our work was going to amount to something. In fact, nearly every member of the House thought our work was going to become something. The Democratic leadership agreed to nine separate ethics moratoriums. And thanks to the moratoriums, Mr. Chairman, we've had nine months during which no ethics complaints have been filed. And it wasn't for nothing. The task force came up with some very good suggestions on how to improve our ethics process. These suggestions were approved by 11 of the 12 members of the task force. And while the task force was meeting, we agreed in no uncertain terms that no amendments would be offered to the package unless they were agreed to by the co-chairs, Congressman Livingston and Congressman Cardin, who both did outstanding work. I hope my Republican colleagues will stick to that agreement. Because of my Republican colleagues decide to use their muscle to make partisan changes to the House ethics process, it will be the first time in history, Mr. Chairman, first time in history of this House that recommendations of a bipartisan ethics task force would have been undermined by partisan amendments. If you turn this into a partisan issue, how can any member, Democrat or Republican, ever have faith in the Ethics Committee? For my part, I sincerely hope my colleagues stand by our agreement. Democrats have dealt in good faith throughout this entire process. Now Republicans must do the same. So I pre uh, prevail on you, my friend, Chairman Solomon, and Mr. Goss, and all of us to honor the work of the task force on which you served. If these recommendations don't have the support of the House, then so be it. But at least allow it to be considered for an up and down vote. So I urge my colleagues to protect this package from the vagaries of the House floor, unless both Mr. Cardin and Mr. Livingston agree to those changes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> well, Mr. Moakley, um, um, you are my friend, and, uh, uh, and you always will be, but I, I just have to take exception to, uh, to some of your statement, uh, particularly the last part, uh, the vagaries of the House. Now, I don't understand that, but um, I do know that there are 435 members of Congress. Uh, I respect all of them, even though we uh, vehemently disagree <laughs> with some of them uh, from time to time. Uh, you mentioned use, uh, use its muscles uh, for partisan amendments. Let me just assure you that um, since uh, I made the announcement on the floor uh, almost a week ago uh, that members would be invited to offer amendments to this package because they are uh, equally representative uh, from the 435 districts in this country representing approximately 600,000 people each, uh, that they are entitled to be heard. Uh, we received uh, 10 amendments uh, that are before us. Uh, five of them are bipartisan. Five of them are partisan, meaning that they do not have an opposite party co-sponsor. And there were uh, about 15 other amendments that were sent to us uh, without names. Uh, some arrived uh, 
uh, anonymously and others were dropped off, but they were just suggestions to us. Uh, I did not even bother to, uh, to print those uh, that were dropped off anonymously. And I commend you for that, Mr. Well, Chairman. And, uh, but we, we have the, uh, the other amendments uh, that do have uh, a sponsor uh, listed on the sheets before you. And after we receive the, uh, the testimony from these two distinguished members, we can debate the issues. But I will say this, uh, I will exercise the prerogative of the chair and, uh, and guarantee you that there will be no partisan amendments allowed on the floor on this issue. Uh, there could be three or four, uh, including a bipartisan amendment by the, uh, by the chairman and the, uh, and the co-chairman of the uh, committee uh, that I believe should be allowed and let the House work its will, but only those that are truly of a bipartisan nature. Now, having said that, let me again uh, express my gratitude to both members, to Bob Livingston and Ben Cardin. You both are very, very highly respected members. That's why you were chosen uh, to head this very, very important task force to try to bring some semblance of, uh, of comedy to the House and, uh, and, and, uh, and have ethics that we can all be proud of in this body. So having said that, let me now recognize Bob Livingston, and then we will call on Ben Cardin after that. Mr. Livingston, you have the floor, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I'm delighted to appear before you uh, with my co-chair, Ben Cardin, uh, who has worked tirelessly with me and with all of the members of the task force uh, to try to bring uh, some uh, restore, uh, some integrity and some uh, uh, credibility uh, to the rules by which members are judged uh, under the standards of official conduct. Uh, I want to pay a special tribute not only to Mr. Cardin, to you, sir, Mr. Chairman, uh, for your service on the committee, uh, for that of Mr. Moakley, uh, uh, and as well, Bill Thomas, Porter Goss, Mike Castle, Jim Hansen, Lou Stokes, uh, Martin Frost, Nancy Pelosi, and Howard Berman. Uh, each of them in their respective capacities as members of the, uh, members of the task force were, were tireless, were dedicated, were conscientious, were honest and decent about uh, trying to bring about a, a, uh, a package which removes the uh, ethics uh, process, the determination of whether people have, may or may not have violated uh, sta the uh, st standards set by the House of Representatives for its members uh, for ethical conduct, uh, so that uh, what may have happened in the, in the last uh, uh, Congress and before, uh, when the process may have gotten bogged down into politics, uh, will never happen again. Now, obviously, that's a tall order, Mr. Chairman. Uh, witness after witness came before us and said that you can have the very best rules uh, that God could des design. In fact, you could have the Ten Commandments themselves. And if you had an individual or individuals on the Committee on Standards of Official Conduct who wanted to uh, misuse those rules to his own purposes or to his political purposes uh, for the benefit of uh, himself or his party, uh, that uh, those rules would do no good, that uh, they could not serve well, and uh, that you might as well not have any rules at all. Uh, that being said, I think we've done a pretty good job. I think we've got an, a superb package, which I recommend to you in, in its totality. Uh, all of the members pitched in from February, early February of this year through June. Uh, we uh, hashed out every word, paragraph, uh, uh, dot and jot uh, uh, in the bill, and then again went back and did it in the report. We closed the bill uh, to amendment by a vote of 12 to nothing, and uh, the report uh, by formal or informal vote uh, was adopted by a vote of 11 to 1. Uh, I think that was significant in and of itself. We then uh, took our final package with minority views, uh, it, it printed them up, uh, made them available to all of the membership of, uh, of the uh, House of Representatives uh, over the period of this last three months. Uh, if members chose to, they could have paid attention, they could have uh, uh, delved into this process as, uh, to as great a degree as they wanted to, uh, come up with amendments uh, which may or may not be considered uh, by this subcommittee. 
But as you pointed out, we've encouraged the members, if they intended to amend them, that they do so in bipartisan fashion. And I think that's significant uh, because this was a bipartisan package. In fact, the ethics process, which began roughly after the years of Watergate, uh, has evolved only, as Mr. Mokley has pointed out, uh, in bipartisan fashion. Uh, generally speaking, neither party uh, has come to the floor and offered up its own amendments or its own proposals uh, for the disposition of the rules of the House. Uh, so I, as, as one of the co-chairs with Mr. Garden, have believed that it was important that we come up with a strongly bipartisan package initially, but I do not believe that uh, we uh, were vested with, uh, with the wisdom of the ages that, that it was so perfect that other members couldn't offer up suggestions if they did so uh, to change uh, our proposals in bipartisan fashion. And so I have no significant objection uh, to uh, your allowing amendments if you accept them uh, from members of both parties together or jointly, uh, so long as I uh, so long as their what they offer does not disrupt the overall fabric or tenor or content uh, of the package that we've uh, evolved uh, and contributed so mightily to. What we have come up for with you uh, uh, for is is a package which uh, provides nonpartisan operations of the standards committee. It enhances the confidentiality of the standard committee's uh, activities. It improves the system for filing information as offered as a complaint. It more efficiently administers the standards uh, committee. It provides greater due process for members, officers, and employ employees of the House of Representatives. It provides greater involvement by members in the process. It provides faster resolution of matters before the Standards Committee. It gives greater latitude to the chairman and ranking member to uh, rid themselves of inconsequential or frivolous matters. In fact, gives the power to the committee itself to deal with frivolous complaints. Uh, and I think presents an overall package of significant peer review. Uh, doctors and, uh, who are professionals or are in charge of uh, policing their own within the medical community. Likewise, lawyers police their own within the legal community. Uh, and uh, university professors uh, do as well. Well, I think it's uh, very appropriate uh, for members of Congress to do it as well. There were suggestions by very uh, well-intentioned, well-meaning members of Congress that we go outside to uh, other persons, other uh, 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 very highly qualified uh, member, uh, citizens of this country uh, to entrust uh, uh, fates, uh, the fate of members to their hands to determine whether or not they had violated uh, uh, the rules of conduct. And I think by overwhelming majority of the task force votes, uh, that thought, that concept uh, was uh, not approved and was, was rejected. Uh, we believe that in the citation that you uh, provided in your very eloquent opening statement uh, under the Constitution, that we are the arbiters of our own conduct and uh, that we should uh, judge our peers and we should not be relieved of that responsibility. Nor should we do so uh, in, in partisan matter, uh, manner or should we uh, in any way inject politics into the process. Uh, the fact that in, in the opinion of many of us, uh, politics uh, was delved in in this process in the past, has unfortunately done much to poison the well of feeling of members of, of confidence in the rules. It's our hope that this process, this work product, will restore that confidence that we, as a body of 435 members of the House and uh, additional delegates, will understand that uh, the administration of the rules of conduct in this House will not be uh, maintained or undertaken in a partisan fashion, and that all fairness, all due process will be accorded to the members, but that meaningful and, and significant violations of the rules of conduct will be dealt with and uh, dealt with uh, fairly, justly, and if necessary, severely. <laughs> well, Chairman Livingston, thank you very, very much. And again, I commend you for all of your work in this issue. Mr. Cardin, you have the floor, sir. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I first want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Moakley, and Mr. Frost, and Mr. Goss, for your, your service on this uh, joint committee. I think the members of the Rules Committee sh should appreciate the leadership that was shown by the four members of the Rules Committee on our task force. They uh, provided a great deal of insight about the history of the ethics process and the work of this committee, and I just really want to first thank you for the, your dedication to this institution and the valuable contributions that each of you have made. There are not many fringe benefits you get for serving either on the Ethics Committee or on the Ethics Task Force, but one fringe or benefit, the or the Rules Committee, but one fringe benefit that I gained was to know Bob Livingston and to see his dedicated leadership and love for this institution. I must tell you, uh, he conducted himself at all times with the best interests of this institution at heart on some very difficult days, and we have uh, worked in a bipartisan manner, and for that I'm indeed grateful. The Republicans are in the majority in Congress. Bob Livingston conducted the work of our task force in a truly bipartisan manner, and I'm deeply appreciative of that. He listened to everyone, and I think as a result of his leadership, we have a product that I hope will be approved uh, by the full House. Uh, Bob's touched on some of the provisions. Let me just cover them quickly because I think it's important that we do not miss this opportunity to improve the ethics process. The package before you will make the process less partisan by providing for professional nonpartisan staff to be appointed by the Ethics Committee, by allowing the, the ranking member as well as the chairman to have access to establishing the agenda of the Ethics Committee. It promotes the confidentiality within the committee work, something that I know every member of Congress is concerned about. It makes it clear that all investigative meetings of the Ethics Committee will be closed. It provides for confidentiality oaths for members who serve on the Ethics Committee and allows us to directly refer to federal agencies matters without having to first take it to the House floor if there's an extraordinary vote within the committee in order to protect confidentiality of a member. It improves the system on the following of complaints. We have abolished or recommend the abolition of the three-member refusal and is substituted with a process that we think makes much more sense, direct following by people who are not members of Congress, but they must have personal knowledge in order to be able to file such a complaint. We provide for a more efficient administration of the committee itself. The initial fact-finding would be done by the chairman and ranking member, preserving the bifurcated process of the Ethics Committee. Subpoenas and expansions of scope of authority of an investigation would be handled within the subcommittee, again, protecting the bifurcation of the ethics process and allowing investigations to be handled more efficiently. Due process for the member is protected at every point by giving the member notice on a pre-statement of alleged violations that are going to be voted on by the committee, as well as expanding the notice that members receive at every aspect of an ethics investigation. There's greater involvement of the members of Congress in the ethics process. We established for a first time a pool of 20 additional members who can assist the Ethics Committee in investigation, getting more members involved in the ethics process. We limit to four years the service on the Ethics Committee and provide for rotation of its members, again, in order to involve more people in understanding how the ethics process it itself works. And we provide for more timely resolutions of matters that are before the committee. The chairman and ranking member have 14 days to determine on an initial complaint that is filed, whether it meets the standards or not. The chairman and ranking member have certain abilities to manage the caseload of the committee and to recommend disposition of matters that can be handled very quickly. There's time limits on when matters must be referred into fact-finding so, so that a matter can't just sit there indefinitely. These are all positive changes in the ethics process. Now, how are we going to get this done? We need a vote on the floor of the House to approve this, and I would urge this committee to bring this recommendation out with a closed rule. <laughs> Every member of this House has already had an opportunity to submit his or her recommendations to our task force. Many took advantage of that. Many of these recommendations are included in the product that's before us. So the members of the House have already had their opportunity to present their recommendations to the bipartisan task force. I am deeply concerned that when you start to allow one amendment to be considered on a matter that has been compromised so that we can have bipartisan support, you can lose 
that bipartisan nature of this recommendation. I, can, I have spoke to many, many Democrats and Republicans, but speaking on behalf of the Democrats, we are confident that this package can go as is, and there is no need for any amendments to be made in order. Lastly, let me point out, I've looked over the amendments that have been suggested, Mr. Chairman. In just about every case, you will recall that these matters were before our committee. We debated them. We went through them. And we came to a conclusion that these changes should not be in the package that we submit. In some cases, we thought by imposing deadlines that would require dismissal, that would just encourage partisan activity in the committee and would lead to delay rather than more efficient operation of the committee. In other cases, we thought that if we restricted the way that complaints can be filed, that we would need to go back to the current rules to at least have some opportunity that exists under the current practice. So these matters have already been reviewed. I talked about the scope of an investigation or subpoena power. That's important for a subcommittee to have those particular rights so that we don't compromise the bifurcation of the process. I'm afraid that in a short debate on the House floor, it's going to be virtually impossible for us to go through how an amendment, as well intended as it may be, receive the type of debate in our committee that it did. As you know, we spent days debating each of these subjects, went through all the ramifications. It's not going to be possible for us to do that on the floor of the House. That's why the joint leadership, the joint leadership constituted a bipartisan task force in order to bring out the recommendations. So I would urge the committee in its wisdom to let the recommendations come forward to the full House, to give us a closed rule, which the committee was operating under. I have looked over all the amendments. None of the amendments that are offered, that have been offered before in a full committee, can truly be called bipartisan, because we've already debated them within the committee, and we've already taken action on them. And lastly, let me say, Mr. Chairman, although I do hope that you bring out this matter as a, as a closed rule with just the manager's amendment being in order. If other amendments are made in order, then I do hope that you will preserve the minority's right for a motion to recommit with or without instructions. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you again. And uh, let me just uh, say as to your last statement, uh, under the rules of the House, this is a simple House resolution which does not require uh, the right of the minority to have a motion to recommit. However, uh, it would be our intention, I'm sure, the, uh, of the uh, committee that if amendments are made in order that we would extend that to this simple House resolution as well. Um, again, I don't want to uh, uh, belabor uh, the, uh, the amendments that, uh, that have been offered. There are uh, a number of them. There were three areas that um, really uh, concerned, I think, members on both sides of the aisle that I personally heard from, Bob and others and you, uh, that uh, were, as you stated correctly, debated in our, in our task force. And one is the, uh, uh, the ability of uh, outside organizations to file complaints. Another is the question of dismissal. Uh, so that uh, uh, complaints don't uh, lie in limbo for just a, uh, an indefinite period of time. And the question of, um, of a subcommittee, once it had been given jurisdiction within a particular scope, uh, that it not be allowed to go beyond that scope without having to go back to the, uh, to the full committee. And certainly you, Mr. Cardin, who served on the, the Ethics Committee so admirably all those years, uh, you understand that uh, we had uh, those concerns were stated by former members of the Ethics Committee, uh, worried that, uh, that subcommittees might go beyond. Uh, the uh, the scope uh, that they were originally given jurisdiction for. So these are areas uh, that uh, uh, I personally was concerned about, as you recall, uh, during our uh, our debates. Uh, but we can debate that here, and we'll have to make um, an honest um, uh, opinion of what uh, where we stand. Now, having said that, uh, uh, I'm going to apologize for having uh, to leave the floor here just for a moment. Uh, I had previously scheduled a meeting with uh, two, two very distinguished noted people from the private sector, uh, and I'm going to go off the floor here just for a few minutes to chat with them, and I'll be right back. I uh, hope you'll understand. Uh, one is uh, a uh, noted uh, actor uh, of uh, some renown. His name is John Travolta, and he's sitting in the back back here. And, a, and another, another is, um, if you like jazz mus uh, music, which I do, uh, is Chick Corea, who is uh, a famous jazz musician. So, uh, Mr. Dreyer, if you'd like to take over for a moment and... Uh, Mr. Chairman, and I hope this is a screen test you're going to have. <laughs> 
just, just, just because you look like the man who came to dinner. Yeah. Bonnie, Bonnie Woolley from a few hundred years ago. Excuse me. We, we, we'd prefer that it's a screen test rather than having you start to play the piano in the next room, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. So uh, let me uh, extend my appreciation to both of you for your very hard work. Uh, since we're introducing people in the room, I should note the fact that uh, Lee Hamilton is sitting on the front row. And the last time uh, we had a project such as the one that your task force undertook was four years ago, in 1993, when we, uh, in the wake of a wide range of scandals around here, established what was known as the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress. During that period of time, I, I heard Joe Moakley mention the number of uh, hearings that you all had and the meetings that you had. Uh, we spent a great deal of time in a bipartisan way working with both the House and the Senate uh, on the issue of ethics reform. And unfortunately, uh, and I would argue that it's the fact that we weren't in the majority then, and I think most Democrats will even admit that, uh, the package that, that we had come out with uh, didn't move uh, to the floor. Uh, I don't even think we got as far as the Rules Committee on it, uh, Lee, back then. Uh, so we weren't able to move ahead with it, but we did have... Uh, a specific recommendation as it related to the ethics issue, and Lee and I testified before your task force on it, and we're sorry that you uh, weren't able to incorporate that in your proposal. I know there are a number of uh, members who uh, oppose it, but I am going to be speaking uh, with Mr. Hamilton uh, in support of uh, the effort to, to do some things that I think uh, you all have touched on, and I think that if we had our proposal, we not only would not undermine uh, the integrity, but in fact would really uh, enhance uh, the integrity of the work product that you have, and that is not to in any way cede our constitutional responsibility for policing uh, the um, actions of our colleagues, but simply to have some outsiders, uh, in fact a pool from which the committee would draw appointed jointly by the uh, Speaker of the House and the Minority Leader to uh, make a determination um, those people would simply do the fact-finding. And uh, we, in a very, very bipartisan way, supported that. We had a number of very distinguished Democrats and Republicans who served on that Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress. And um, when we knew of the work that you all were proceeding with, uh, Lee and I did testify, as I said, and I think that uh, if we are going to be making uh, amendments in order. It's a bipartisan amendment, and I would hope very much that we could. Um, I'm going to take a few minutes to explain the package with Lee before the, the committee, but you all are familiar with it. If you'd like to comment on it at all now, I'd certainly welcome that. Well, first, Mr. Dreyer, I want to thank you for the work, and Mr. Hamilton, for the work that you've done on it. I think it's a, it is a good proposal to look at a different way to handle ethics issues in uh, the, um, the Congress. But you can't avoid the constitutional responsibility. It's up to the members of the House to judge. Absolutely. Their own. It's required in the Constitution. And how we do that is how we will be judged. I am concerned that your proposal compromises the constitutional responsibility. We did consider it. We rejected the proposal. Uh, it is truly a bipartisan effort. I would acknowledge that. There's interest on both sides of the aisle, Democrats and Republicans, who believe that we should use outsiders, at least in the initial stages of investigation. And, I, and there's some, uh, also some credible outside groups that have also made that recommendation. So I think it's a very credible proposal. I would hope, though, that we would not use, that, that we would give our process a chance to work and when you take a look at the many cases and the many matters that have been handled over time by the Ethics Committee, the committee has done a pretty good job. We talk about having deadlocks within the committee, but in fact there hasn't been a single case that has not been handled within the ethics process. It may have taken a while, but we were able to resolve them, and I think satisfactorily. So I would hope that we would reform the process for internal review and that we would defer your type of a recommendation to see whether these new procedures won't satisfy many of the concerns that have been raised. Before Mr. Livingston says anything, I should open by congratulating him and saying that we are now voting on final passage on the Treasury Postal Appropriations Bill on the House floor. So congratulations, Mr. Chairman, on moving another package through. Now you can malign my amendment if you'd like. Uh, <laughs> I would never malign your amendment, Mr. Chairman, uh, and I uh, thank you for the opportunity to reply. Actually, I, my response is very brief. I agree with 
Mr. Cardin. We did consider your, uh, your proposal uh, in depth, uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, I think you're premature. Uh, among uh, the members that was on this task force, uh, uh, the, there, was, there was not a lot of support. Uh, that's not to say that in some future date, your amendment may ultimately become the rule of the day. There's a serious problem with that, though. Lee Hamilton is retiring at the end of this Congress. <laughs> well, and we want to get this through before Lee retires. Uh, you'll forgive us if we don't leap on it uh, immediately today. But uh, in the name of Mr. Hamilton, and I know that uh, uh, other members will gleefully uh, uh, join with you in future years to offer it. And uh, future task forces will have the opportunity uh, to, uh, to consider it. And I'm pleased to say that I won't be on one of those tests. <laughs> uh, I, I would only add, uh, Mr. Chairman, in addition that I, I neglected something uh, very important. Uh, uh, each of us, as members of the task force, were represented by personal uh, staff. And uh, the staff were headed up with, uh, by uh, Richard J. Leon, special counsel, and David H. Lofman, assistant to the special counsel, who also serves uh, as counsel on the uh, Standards of Official Conduct Committee. Uh, my own staff, Stan Skokie, and Mr. Cardin's staff person, uh, Michelle Ash, uh, uh, all worked with the, the staff representatives of the other members uh, and were of invaluable service. We put countless hours uh, in on this work product, and despite the fact that we left out your, uh, your very worthwhile proposal, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think we did come up with a pretty good product, and we couldn't have done it without good staff. Congratulations. You're going to say something, Ben? No, I... I agree. I'm glad that Mr. Livingston mentioned the staff because they really did a tremendous job and we were very appreciative. Mr. Moakley. Uh, <clears throat> I really want to commend you both gentlemen. I mean, having the uh, good fortune to be appointed to the task force against my will, uh, I had the opportunity to see how both you gentlemen worked. And believe me, it was as fair a process <clears throat> that I've seen during my entire uh, terms of, in the Congress. And, and I think you came out with a great package. I mean, it's not perfect, but nothing is. And I just think that we should allow the membership to vote the entire package up and down. I agree with Mr. Card, and I, I think the amendments that are proposed uh, have been amendments that we went through word by word, sentence by sentence, and found them lacking. And, and I just think that your product uh, should be given to the House for their uh, ability to vote it up and down. Mr. Moakley uh, may reply. I, I, I would only reinforce uh, your, your statement, uh, not to the exclusion of any uh, bi well-meaning, well-intentioned bipartisan amendments. But the fact is that our work product has been reviewed by numerous uh, uh, groups. Uh, I might say that uh, Mr. Gary Ruskin of, uh, of the group that is affiliated with Ralph Nader uh, doesn't like our package. Uh, Common Cause, uh, represented by uh, Ms. Ann McBride, uh, doesn't like our package. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, David Mason of the Heritage Foundation, uh, Thomas Mann of the Brookings Foundation, and uh, American Enterprise uh, Institute, represented Norman by Norman Ornstein, uh, is, are all in favor of it, have testified for it, and uh, are, have written in favor of it. Uh, they think it's a good package as well. That's like getting a thumbs up from Siskel and Ebert. I mean, I think that... <laughs> and we uh, should put out that those groups that are not happy with the package would like to have seen us gone further than we did. I, I don't think there is... Um, there are some parts of the package that are controversial with some of the outside groups, but by and large, there is... A, praise for many sections by all parties that it would improve the process. Well, as I say, I, I'm, I'm very happy to, to even been a small part of this, but I was very fortunate to be able to be in the room and watch you two gentlemen start from opposing areas and come right down the middle and work it out, and it, it wasn't political. And I commend you for it, and I'm willing to vote up or down right now on this package. Mr. Lender. Mr. Frost. Um, I just have a question or two uh, for Mr. Livingston, uh, particularly about the Mirtha Tozan Amendment Number 4. Uh, we debated this at great length in the uh, committee on the ta in the task force. Um, this, uh, this amendment, if it were adopted by the House, would totally remove the ability of any private citizen uh, to file a complaint before the Ethics Committee if that private citizen could not convince a member of Congress to uh, lend his name or her name to that complaint. 
And uh, what is your position on the, on the Mirtha Tozan Amendment? Mr. Frost, uh, of all of the amendments, I think this is the one that probably is felt more <laughs> deeply by more members uh, than, than any of the others. Uh, this one uh, does, in fact, revert to the rules of the House prior to 1989 and the revision of those rules which you and I participated in. Uh, as you recall, there was great pressure to open the rules back uh, in 1989 to outside persons to file against members of the House. And we adopted uh, what I call the three blind mice rule. Uh, the rule that says if uh, it, you can't just come in directly, but if you get a member to sponsor your, uh, your filing, or if in fact you get three people who say they will not sponsor uh, your filing and writing, you can file whatever you want. Uh, our proposal uh, felt that that was disingenuous and had been poorly used. And so we abandoned that in this task force program. And what we proposed was to elevate the standard uh, to require personal knowledge of the person filing to constitute their review of per, uh, personal or records kept in the ordinary course of business or personal affairs or uh, in federal or state uh, agencies, uh, or that they had to either have seen the event of which they complained or been told by the person who saw the event, thereby being one uh, step removed hearsay. Uh, I thought that, I think that's a pretty good package. However, there are those members in, on both sides of the aisle who feel very strongly that by going that far and opening it, uh, the, the complaint process to any person in the whole world puts some members under political pressure for their political views on specific issues, which might engender some manufactured complaint against them uh, simply because some other person or group might disagree with their political views. Uh, I cannot deny that that is a very strongly felt emotion. And for that reason, I uh, am not opposed to this committee making the amendment in order. Uh, I do believe our package is solid and sound. However, uh, I can understand the feelings of those who propose or who favor that amendment. Mr. Livingston, if I understand the procedures in the United States Senate, uh, the Senate permits uh, third-party groups to file uh, complaints, individuals or third-party groups, without being sponsored by a member of the Senate. Ms. Frost, they do, but I, my, it's my... Uh, experience that they exercise their uh, judgment in, uh, in, in in selecting those f complaints which might be entertained as complaints before the committee very judiciously, very uh, strictly. In other words, they really don't recognize very many of those complaints. Now, that, of course, uh, is a separate issue in terms of how the committee itself functions. That's true. This amendment would be seen as closing down the process and making it more difficult for private citizens to raise matters before the Ethics Committee. And quite frankly, though, I wasn't 100 percent in agreement with the provision that we ultimately uh, came up with in the committee. I think that provision is far superior to this provision. Okay. And I think this it would be a mistake for us to make this amendment in order or for the House to adopt this amendment. That, that is a, a valid argument, Mr. Frost. However, I, I would say that, as you know, uh, we banned outside people from using press clippings as the uh, as the uh, underpinning for their uh, for as, we should have. As, as we should have uh, and uh, there's nothing to stop however uh, the committee taking press clippings uh, under uh, in of its own volition and uh, under its uh, scrutiny and initiating its own complaint nor is there any uh, 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 any uh, uh, prohibition against uh, individual members bringing those clippings to the attention of the member and uh, Could, uh, thereby <clears throat> encouraging a complaint. If I might, uh, Martin, we only have about a minute left yeah. on this vote. This is the last vote of the day. It is final passage on a bill. So I would suggest that we recess for uh, seven minutes, uh, go down and vote, and come right back. We yes, if you would. I think there are people that have other questions of you, Ben. Can we stand and recess for seven minutes?
questions or making statements or asking some questions. Um, we were in the process of asking members uh, if they wanted to make statements or ask questions. And Mrs. Slaughter, you are recognized uh, if you're seeking recognition. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, first, I want to compliment you for this. And, and I agree with what Mr. Moakley said, that the bipartisan and, and extraordinary way you put this together is something all of us are proud of. Uh, but I, I'm much the 20-person pool of members. This is going to be chosen at the beginning of a term and called on when necessary. And what would trigger that? The, uh, the majority and minority leader would appoint the pool at the beginning of the term of Congress. Uh, it would be equal number of Democrats and Republicans. The chairman and ranking member of the committee would call upon this pool when they believed it was necessary in order to supplement the workload of the committee. They would need to, re to choose an equal number of outside people to work with permanent members of the committee so that there would always be an equal number. But it'd be up to the, there's no standard other than the workload of the committee uh, justifying that the That would trigger that? Uh, ben, would, would you choose directly off the list top to bottom, or would you pick certain members for various expertise or anything and just? That's not uh, really clear from okay. our rules. I think the chairman and ranking member would probably work with the presiding officer and the, the uh, minority leader to figure out what system to use. Okay. One, one of the problems you have in some cases, you may not want to use a member from a particular state because of the person is from that state. Uh -huh. So there may be need for flexibility in order to make sure that you have pool members who can sit objectively in evaluation of a member. All right. Mr. If I may, Ms. Slaughter, uh, the reason for the jury pool was because that we found in, in testimony of witnesses and in the, in the experiences of counsel and, uh, and uh, previous members that the workload of prior ethics or, excuse me, standards of official conduct committee members uh, was intense, that all of the workload was being done by the full committee, that they were constantly being uh, chained to the uh, committee room uh, in order to deal with the, the myriad of, uh, of allegations uh, that were before them against so many members. And of course, we have 435 members plus delegates. Uh, so there was a possibility of, of just unlimited uh, of service. Instead of having a 12-member committee in and of itself, uh, we, we opted for a 10-member committee who would preside in, uh, over the full, full committee. It would, it would be parceled off into subcommittees. Subcommittees would be comprised of uh, at least two, possibly four members of the full committee uh, to investigate the activities uh, uh, alleged. Uh, and would be supplemented with members in the jury pool for the investigative stages. Only? Uh, only. Okay. And uh, the th theory is, uh, under our uh, proposal, is that only a few members will, uh, in, in, will investigate in depth the allegations against a single member, and that that will free up the full committee to serve as the ju adjudicatory committee uh, with the remaining members not serving on the subcommittee to actually adjudicate once an investigative subcommittee reports to them. Okay. And uh, it's, it was really a prim primarily a division of workload uh, proposal uh, that prompted us to go to this outside jury strictly for the investigative stage. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I, uh, <clears throat> before yielding to other members, uh, <clears throat> I had been concerned, as you know, during the, uh, the task force proceedings about frivolous uh, complaints being being filed. And um, I had attempted to offer an amendment which would have uh, uh, forced uh, those uh, who were uh, obviously deliberately filing frivolous complaints and, and creating an, an expense to the Ethics Committee uh, that uh, they uh, be responsible for reimbursing the committee. Uh, would uh, Ben, I know you were involved in that, and we, we ended up with a watered-down version, but could you explain to us just where we stand on that issue in the, in the base text of the bill that will go to the floor? Because we do not have an amendment dealing with it. I'm going to go along with whatever we did, but just for the record, could you explain well, it to us? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you, you were extremely active in the task force to point out the need to really protect a member and protect the institution and protect the process from complaints that are filed for frivolous reasons. We're all very much concerned about that, and we want to make sure that 
we uh, discourage those types of matters. Uh, there is a provision in the resolution that's before you, Section 19, that says if a complaint or information operator's complaint is deemed frivolous by an affirmative vote of a majority of the members of the committee on standards of official conduct, the committee may take such action as if by an affirmative vote of the majority of its members deems appropriate in the circumstances. I think it's a clear message by having a specific provision in the rules here that the, uh, we expect the committee to take action against a member who files a frivolous complaint. Uh, so it, it, uh, there already are implicit provisions for this if someone abuses the process. We're now putting an explicit provision in the uh, committee rules, actually in the House rules, uh, to make it clear that we will not tolerate such misconduct. <laughs> well, I thank you very much. <clears throat> and I think that might uh, go a long way towards, you know, trying to remove some of the politics, you know, that uh, invariably does pop up. And uh, if members know that they are going to be held responsible monetarily uh, for frivolous complaints, I think we'll, it'll help correct that problem. And I thank you for your work on that area. Uh, questions of the witness? Chairman, I would just like uh, to commend the gentlemen for their very hard work, and um, it has been very difficult. You came up with a wonderful, wonderful product. I believe myself it can be proved upon minimally, um, but and as a former judge, uh, with a keen eye for fairness, I think that you have done a, a great service to this body, and I just want to give you my personal uh, thank you. Uh, this has something, uh, is something that has the potential to touch every member, and uh, we can't be too careful. And so, once again, thank you. Mr. diaz Bilar. You have done great work, gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. McGinnis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to commend the members, uh, the chairmen, who put a lot of effort in this. This is a thankless assignment, and I uh, think you've done an excellent job. The gentleman from Washington, Mr. Hastings. I would just like to associate uh, uh, my comments with what's been said uh, here. I, I don't envy you going through this. In my, uh, in my time in the state legislature, we didn't have an ethics committee. And I don't know if I won't judge if that's good or bad, uh, but I commend you for trying to come up with a product that both sides uh, can can accept. So I, I congratulate you on that. <clears throat> Gentlemen, um, uh, we want to again thank you for your diligent work. Uh, there it is more than likely we will be on the floor with this matter to uh, tomorrow, and uh, we will certainly take your testimony into consideration. Uh, Mr. Uh, Livingston, do you have a oh, question? One last note, Mr. Chairman. Uh, of course, uh, Mr. Cardin and I have agreed to offer a, a manager's amendment which uh, uh, makes uh, applicable, to, uh, which will make the uh, complaints, excuse me, make the rules that we're adopting, assuming that the House does adopt them, applicable to all complaints filed uh, since the moratorium was lifted uh, to uh, uh, the current, uh, to the day that we adopt them, so that there's no anomaly between uh, the time that the complaints were filed and the, uh, the ultimate rules are adopted. Likewise, we will have colloquy on the floor uh, to the effect that any previous complaints which are accepted by the committee, which might have been filed previously, will be treated in the same manner under the new rules adopted. Uh, that's, that, of course, is up to the discretion of the uh, uh, full committee. Uh, I might simply ask for the record, though, uh, with respect to the motion to recommit that you intend to grant uh, to the minority, and I have no objections to that, uh, that uh, uh, that motion to be recommit uh, be uh, confected uh, in the same bipartisan fashion that we've done everything else, so that we're not surprised or uh, uh, taken off guard by uh, some uh, partisan uh, maneuver. Okay. <laughs> Fine, gentlemen, just uh, <clears throat> without question, uh, your manager's amendment uh, containing that uh, information will be made in order. Uh, that won't require a lot of debate, would it? Ten minutes? That's fine. That's fine. Thank you very much. That'll, that's appreciated. Thank you, Thank you very much Thank for coming. You. The uh, next scheduled witness is the uh, uh, the uh, vice chairman of the Rules Committee, uh, Mr. David Dreyer of California, accompanied by uh, one of the most respected members of this body, uh, like the the the, the, uh, <laughs> the gentleman from uh, uh, from Indiana, Mr. Hamilton, and uh, Mr. Dreyer, and I, Mr. Shea is also. If he's um, if he shows up, he's welcome to join you. 
Uh, gentlemen, your entire statements will appear in the record without objection, and uh, uh, feel free to take whatever time you might need. Mr. Dreyer, you're recognized, sir. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, let me uh, first express my appreciation to, uh, as I've already done so, uh, to Lee Hamilton for the uh, effort that he's put into this, and of course for Chris Shays, who is uh, joining us, and uh, Paul McHale. We clearly wanted to uh, subscribe to what both you, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Moakley have said, and that is a bipartisan spirit in dealing with this. And uh, I also, having heard the names of Tom Mann and Norm Ornstein from the chairman of the task force, Mr. Livingston, uh, should underscore the fact that when the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress met, uh, they played a key role in fashioning this amendment as they did uh, much of the package that has, uh, or at least been supportive of much of the package that has come forth uh, from the task force. Uh, I think that if one listened to the description that I heard from Mr. Livingston as I was walking back in from that vote that we were having downstairs, um, I was struck by the fact that he was really describing exactly what it is that our amendment would do. Only he was using present members, uh, whereas we call for the involvement of outsiders. And I know that that sends a, uh, a red flag up for many people, and a number of people are concerned about that. But in the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress, we spent a great deal of time, as you well know, Mr. Chairman, you were a member of that committee that, that Lee and I co-chaired, and there are a number of others here who were part of that effort. We spent a great deal of time looking at this, and we know that this institution has a credibility problem amongst our colleagues, within the press corps, and among the American people. And I think the words of the present chairman of the Ethics Committee, Jim Hansen, are very key as he, in his uh, statement that he signed as a member of this task force that's bringing this report forward, uh, made it clear that we, on the horizon, uh, will, if we don't adopt this amendment, clearly see outsiders involved. Now, Mr. Cardin mentioned, in response to my statement, his concern about uh, the constitutionality of moving ahead with this. And that, obviously, was a key item that Lee and I had discussed uh, in the Joint Committee. We clearly want to ensure that members of Congress adjudicate and do handle the policing of our colleagues. But at the same time, if we look at the prospect of having the Speaker of the House and the Minority Leader jointly, and I underscore the word jointly, appoint 20 individuals, whether they're former members of Congress, retired judges, outsiders, not lobbyists, but others who uh, again, would jointly be selected, meaning that the speaker couldn't all of a sudden appoint people who he thought you know, would go after the minority and vice versa. Uh, so this would be something that would be done in tandem. I think that it would uh, help a lot. One of the issues that uh, Mr. Livingston raised was this workload question for the task force. When I look back at our colleague Porter Goss and the work that he uh, went through last December, uh, it was obviously very, very overwhelming. And it seems to me that one of the things that this amendment would do is it would allow the fact-finding part of it to be done uh, by those people who have been appointed. So I, I uh, really do believe that this amendment does not undermine the integrity of the excellent work of this task force. And I've been very supportive of it. And uh, again, I don't think that it raises the kinds of constitutional concerns that, that others have. I appreciate the fact that Chris Shays, who supported a similar proposal, has come forward. Uh, Kurt Weldon has indicated his interest in this, Paul McHale. Uh, there are a wide range of Republicans and Democrats all the way across the, uh, the board who are supportive of this. And had we not had such uh, diversity in the Joint Committee and the Organization of Congress in 1993 uh, supporting it, uh, I don't think that we would have gotten to the point where we are today. And so, uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, thank you for uh, the, the consideration to say again that I, I hope that we'll be able to do this uh, before Lee Hamilton does retire. As you've said, he uh, is uh, sorely missed. And so that's why I sort of suspect that this just might be the only opportunity before Lee Hamilton retires for us to do it. And so that's why I've chosen to seize upon it. Well, we can file them with the rest of the Hamilton papers. <laughs> yeah. okay, so. uh, first of all, David, we want to thank you. and. Um, and Lee Hamilton for the Herculean uh, effort that you made in, in reforming uh, this house. Uh, the, uh, your effort uh, has made it a better house. And uh, uh, we are going to miss uh, Lee Hamilton and uh, 
uh, and his family dearly. He's uh, one of the, and I was uh, said before, he's one of the most respected members of this body. And uh, uh, Whitley, uh, although it's a long time away, a whole year to, and a quarter yet, uh, uh, we know that you're going to have a lot of legislation come to the floor between now and then. Uh, you are recognized, sir. Mr. Chairman, thank you. It's uh, always a pleasure to come before the Rules Committee because uh, you give very courteous treatment to me and to other members, and uh, we deeply appreciate it. Uh, I want to say that Mr. Livingston and Mr. Cardin have done an excellent job. Uh, I don't think you can find two busier members of this institution. They have enormous responsibilities, <clears throat> and yet they have taken uh, many, many hours. I don't know what it is many, many hours to produce this task force report, and uh, I think the whole body should uh, express appreciation to them. Um, I think the proposal that Mr. Dreyer and I have put together is uh, certainly bipartisan. I think it's very moderate, I think it's serious, and I think it's uh, meaningful. Uh, I, I want to say a special word of appreciation to Dave Dreyer. Uh, I hope I don't offend anyone by saying this, but it's really very unusual for a member of the Rules Committee to disagree with their party leadership. Uh, and he's doing that in this case. Uh, that is extraordinary. It is not unprecedented. It has been done. But it doesn't happen very often. What's happened to those who have uh, done it in the past? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they've it's gone... Doing very well in the private sector. <laughs> uh, they, uh, they usually go. Be, they usually go before the ethics committee. Uh, Mr. I, uh, I appropriate almost sanctions. Mm. Uh, but well, I do. Lee, to interrupt you just for a minute, I almost found out when I led the fight against NAFTA a few years you ago. Found. <laughs> <laughs> There's still after him on that. Go ahead. Now, let Sorry. me let me try. To, uh, I uh, of course would like my statement put into the record. Yes, without objection. Uh, let me try to respond to a couple of things. I, I think the thing that worries the task force a lot with our proposal, which is to appoint this pool of 20 independent fact finders uh, to be called upon by the Standards Committee for ethics investigations as needed. I think the thing that worries them about it is a sense of loss of control. Uh, members are losing control. Uh, may I suggest that that really is not the case because what you're doing here is, is keeping the power in the Standards Committee but giving them an option that they now do not have and that is the option to appoint outsiders. They don't have to use it. It is within their discretion. And if they don't want to use it, they don't have to. But if they're in circumstances where they think it would be helpful, they can. So you don't lose control if you expand options. And I think that's what we're doing here. Uh, and let me emphasize that under our process, you use the independent fact finders only only when the committee itself makes the judgment that uh, the, the independent fact finders are helpful. Now, the second point I want to address is the point that Mr. Cardin made, and that is that uh, he, he saw here an avoidance of constitutional responsibility. Dave talked about that. Uh, I, I would agree with that if, in fact, we put into the hands of the fact finders the power to adjudicate, but we don't do that. What we do is delegate one function, and that is the investigatory function. And they report to the committee, and the committee acts on their recommendation. They don't have to accept it. Uh, that's not an avoidance of constitutional responsibility, because the House, the committee, retains the authority for adjudication. Mr. Cardin described our proposal as a very creditable proposal. I thank him for that, and Dave and I believe that to be the case. Uh, if it is the case, then it seems to me that the Rules Committee ought to give the members of this House the chance, the option, to vote on it, up or down. I don't have the slightest idea how the vote would come out. <laughs> I've, I've run no counts. I know the leadership on both sides is opposed to it, so you would normally expect that the amendment would not be accepted, but I'm not sure of that. But I am sure that the members think the, enough of this proposal that they, th they ought to have a chance to vote on it. Uh, Mr. Livingston made quite a point, I think, that uh, I guess it was Mr. Cardin that said that members had reviewed very care members of the task force had reviewed very carefully these proposals. I have no doubt of that. I'm sure they have. 
But I think uh, members ought to have that uh, same opportunity. The advantages of this proposal is that it reduces the inherent conflict of interests involved when members judge fellow members. I think it would reduce the partisan rancor that uh, has often accompanied the, uh, the ethics process. I think it would uh, help reduce the stalling that has occurred. Uh, I think it was uh, either Mr. Livingston or Mr. Cardin who said that uh, the ethics process has worked fairly well. Uh, I, I guess I don't agree with that judgment. I don't think you'd have appointed the task force if it had been working so well. The reason the task force was appointed is because the leadership saw that it wasn't working very well. And I think you have to have if this, if a, a creditable task force report or product here if you're going to uh, gain a greater public confidence uh, in the process. Um, so, uh, Mr. Chairman, I hope you'll give this serious consideration. I think it's a very modest proposal, indeed, and uh, one that would reflect credit on the House, and I, I'm just quite confident members would appreciate the opportunity to vote on it. I thank you for your consideration. <coughs> well, Lee, thank you for your testimony, and um, I know you, uh, you were very sincere in, uh, yeah. in your statement. Mr. Shays. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I know that you have opposed your leadership on a number of occasions. I hope that you don't have to oppose them to bring forward this amendment. Uh, but uh, Mr. Dreyer and Mr. Hamilton, in particular, deserve this opportunity since the entire body asked them to have a reform committee. Uh, it first was the Hamilton Dreyer Reform Committee, and then it became the Dreyer Hamilton Reform Committee when we changed parties. But the bottom line is they worked on a bipartisan basis and did yeoman's work, and they're right on target. Uh, Mr. I, second, by the way, I, should say I, I understand that. I understand that. Uh, I, I would say to you that Mr. McHale and I had come in with a uh, less modest proposal in that we wanted the uh, Ethics Committee basically uh, to be disbanded and uh, people from the outside to come in, assume the role of the Ethics Committee, and then refer the judgment uh, and action to the uh, Congress. Uh, this is a more modest proposal that would certainly deserve, uh, and, and I think, a happy compromise between both, uh, both views, one no private membership and those with private membership. Uh, basically, we've had in the past lawyers drudging lawyers, and the American people have said that's an outrage. We've had doctors judging doctor, doctors, and we brought in people that weren't doctors judging doctors. And we need to bring people who aren't politicians to judge us. But we meet the constitutional requirement without any doubt whatsoever, because it would only be a proposal to the full Congress, and in this case, to the Ethics Committee. And the Ethics Committee would vote out the punishment, and Congress would have to ratify it. We meet the constitutional question without any question. But I would just say to you, we know the system has been abused by both parties. We all know it. We also know that the American people have no faith in politicians, elected officials judging each other. Uh, and we think that this proposal brings in a wonderful element of outsiders who come in and say, you know, this has no merit. This was partisan. We don't count it as valid. And they could say that when politicians would have a difficult time saying it. In other cases, they'd say, you know, you need to reckon this issue. And I know you're all friends. And I know you all like each other, but this is our view, and punishment is deserved. And then they set on the record uh, a case that we would then have to respond to. So I, I strongly urge you, Mr. Chairman, to uh, have that independent streak if necessary. But uh, certainly you want a good government streak, which no one else can, can, uh, can match, uh, and allow for an honest and open debate on this. And I conclude by saying the one thing I really believed when this new Republican majority took control that we would have more debate and it would be open and we would let ideas win or lose the issue. <coughs> well, Chris, thank you uh, very, very much. Mr. Moakley? No questions. Uh, any questions of the witnesses? Well, if not, uh, again, I will. May I ask the consent of the statement of Mr. McHale appear in the record? Without objection, it will appear. And without objection, all of your statements will appear yeah. in the record. Thank and, you very uh, much. Thank we appreciate you gentlemen coming before us. Mr. Dreyer, will you please... Uh, Approach the bench. <laughs> the uh, next scheduled witness uh, is uh, 
a very respected member of this body, and uh, she uh, also uh, uh, was on the task force for the uh, uh, for the ethics reform. And uh, Mrs. Pelosi, if you'd like to come forward, your entire statement will appear in the record too, without objection, and you may proceed at will. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have my copies here because I wasn't sure that I was you were going to have time for me to uh, testify. Right. Thank you very much once again for your courtesy to you. Sorry. Uh, to Mr. Mokley and to the members of the uh, members of the committee. As you mentioned, I served with you as a member of the task force, and I'm here to support the recommendation of the task force. I served for six years for three terms as a member of the Ethics Committee and worked alongside of you and our co-chairs uh, on the task force from February until June. As you know, we worked every day, and uh, uh, our, we were very um, well led in, in both cases. Mr. Livingston and Mr. Cardin worked hard and long. They were the models of decorum and patience in trying to build consensus from a, some very uh, divergent views. Uh, I had some additional views which I added to the task force report because the task force was not everything I would have written personally myself. But that is no reason for me not to support it. Uh, because I do think it was a compromise and a, a consensus pro bipartisan product worthy of support. And it is predicated on members of Congress judging their peers. The Constitution requires and the American people expect members of Congress to do just that and to uphold a high ethical standard in doing so. And that aspect of the task force, I think, uh, should remain intact. That's why I come before you today Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, and ask uh, that you present uh, the task force report with a closed rule. Uh, many of the other suggestions are worthy that we are hearing, but the last thing we need in the ex ethics process now, I think, is a mishmash. As I said, I would have changed some things in the task final report, but at this point, to be amending it, I think, is uh, to change the nature of the, of the balance contained therein. Uh, I think that the option for the members of Congress would be the rules uh, that we have, the present rules that we operate under, which I think um, do not need major overhauling. I do think that they need enforcement, but I don't think they need major overhauling. I think the task force product is an improvement on the current rules, but I think that uh, a haphazard amendment of the task force proposal will take us to a place that is not progress. Uh, not having the rules that we ha operate under now um, enforced, not having the task force report which was thoughtfully uh, prepared, um, implemented, but having some combination thereof which would, I think, have constitutional problems. And yes, uh, Congress suffers in terms of its reputation. But that doesn't mean that Congress is not capable of judging its own, as I said, as the Constitution requires and the American people expect. And so in that spirit and in, on uh, the basis of my many years of experience on the committee, and I served also as a, um, for one year as a member of the Special Investigative uh, uh, Committee, subcommittee of the uh, Ethics Committee, that seems like 10 years rolled up in, in, into one. Uh, but I believe that, uh, that it brought, gave me uh, the credentials to serve on the task force, to support its recommendation, and to come before you, as I say, not with a task force report that I personally would have written, but one that I strongly support and urge you to bring it to the floor under a closed rule. And I say that with <coughs> the highest regard for the makers of all the other motions. I see their case, uh, but I commend Mr. Livingston and Mr. Cardin uh, for their leadership in the product that they presented to the House. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, Mrs. Pelosi, uh, uh, your opinion is uh, is certainly respected, and uh, and uh, you make a lot of, you make a lot of sense. Uh, uh, we have uh, a responsibility, I think, to be fair to the entire membership, uh, while at the same time trying trying to protect the uh, the committee product because the committee product, as you mentioned. Uh, was the basis of much negotiation. You stated in the very beginning that you did not get um, all that you wanted. Uh, certainly, I did not get all that I wanted, and uh, I compromised far more than I ever thought I would. 
Uh, so I'm put in a particular predicament because some of the bipartisan amendments that have been uh, asked for are areas that I fought for. And uh, I guess what I'm going to do, uh, although I haven't made up my mind, is I'll probably vote for the, uh, for the product no matter what the outcome of the amendments. And should the amendments all fail, it would then in effect be the same as a closed rule and I would probably be voting along with you because uh, it certainly was compromise from both sides, uh, uh, from both liberals and moderates and conservatives from both sides of the aisle. And, um, and one way or the other, it's going to be a better product than what we have to operate under today. I appreciate your coming. Uh, Mr. Mokley? I just want to congratulate you, Nancy, for your diligence on this committee. You're really a leader to some of us on some of the amendments. Well, it was a pleasure working with you, Mr. Mokley, and with Mr. Solomon and Mr. Goss, Goss who's, who's also not on here. this committee. And uh, we had the benefit of the thinking of members of the Rules Committee, uh, some of whom had served on the Ethics Committee as well. Uh, so uh, some of you had triple credentials, and uh, we all benefited from your experience. Mr. Thanks. Dreyer, any questions of the witness? If not, Nancy, again, thank you very much thank uh, you, Mr. For, Chairman, for coming. Mr. The uh, next uh, scheduled witness, uh, uh, I believe, is a panel. Uh, is uh, Mr. Menendez is here. Mr. Barrett, were you, did you want to testify along with Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Menendez and Mr. Shays? Okay. Shays of Connecticut. Uh, who would care to lead off for the panel? Mr. Men Menendez of New Jersey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank uh, you and the distinguished members of the committee for giving us an opportunity to make our case for this amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members on both sides of the aisle talk a lot about doing away with Washington perks, but this is uh, a chance to do something about what I consider a totally unjustifiable benefit. The floor of the House of Representatives is one that's owned by the American people and trusted to our care so that the elected representatives of the people have a place to do the people's business, represent the people's views through debate, negotiation, and legislation. Uh, no other use, I think, could be uh, defended to the American people. In honor of their service to the people, former members of Congress are given access to the House floor. And if this remains an honorary privilege, as I am supportive of, it could be defended. But if it is used in any way to personally or financially benefit some former members, it is, in my view, a breach of the trust that the American people gave to us. Now, the current House rules permit a member, a former member, to use the House floor to lobby for his or her own personal or financial gain, so long as it does not concern legislation pending on the floor or reported out of committee. Now, whether or not there is legislation pending shouldn't matter. A former member shouldn't be able to use their status to lobby for any personal or financial gain on the floor. For example, let's say a question regarding a former member's legal fees is pending before the House or before a House committee. I believe few, if any, members would think it's proper for that former member to take to the House floor to lobby to have his legal fees paid but the current rules would allow it and they shouldn't. The bipartisan amendment that we are offering here with my friends and Mr. Shays, Connecticut and Mr. Barrett would prevent these unethical situations by expanding the current prohibition to include denial of access to any member who has a personal or a financial interest in any measure or matter under consideration in any committee or any subcommittee. And there's clear precedent for this type of change, Mr. Chairman. Under the current rules, a former member is already barred from the floor if they represent a client for the purpose of influencing legislation under consideration in a committee or subcommittee. So why should the rules change for the member's personal interests? Clearly, the current rules are more lenient when it comes to a member's personal interests, but they should not be. And this amendment would rectify that situation. For those who might raise, and this is the final point I want to bring, Mr. Chairman, a germaneness issue, I would ask, when reforming the ethical standards and procedures of the House, what could be more critical and important than keeping the House floor a sanctuary for democracy for all, not privilege for a few, and making sure the people's house remains the people's house, not the lobbyist house, not the former member's house, but the people's house. If we're here to restore the confidence of the American people and the ethical standards of the House, then this amendment exactly does that. 
I can think of no better vehicle for this legislation, and I ask you that you allow this amendment to be considered by the full House, waive any points of order that might be held against it. Without objection. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Menendez. Uh, Mr. Barrett, would you like to proceed? And then we'll call on Mr. Shays to be the cleanup hitter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a, a pleasure again to appear before your committee. You've been very kind to us in the past, and it's especially nice for me to appear with my good friend, Mr. Shays. And uh, I was actually honored that Mr. Menendez contacted both Mr. Shays and I because both of us have appeared here many times uh, arguing for amendments that go to the integrity of this institution. Um, and I'm someone who believes that, that those of us who offer these amendments are doing so not to tear down the institution, but actually to help um, improve its confidence among the public. And that's why I'm here today. I think that this is a sensible rule. I think that uh, members of this body who have left um, should have the privilege of being able to return to talk to their former colleagues. But I think that there's, there's a line that's an important line that should not be crossed. And I think that this measure addresses that. Um, clearly, there are times when there are matters before committees, um, whether a committee meets and is initially holding informational hearings and there is no legislation pending, where under the current rules, um, a former member could come and help shape the course of those informational hearings and, and perhaps go so far as to um, seek co-sponsors for legislation that has not yet been introduced. Um, I don't think that that is the spirit or the intent of what the rules should be. Um, that's why when I looked at the current rule, I thought that this was a very common sense change um, that I think will Im improve the rules of the House and in, in no way um, deny the access to, to members who, who want to come back and, and talk to former colleagues. Um, I very much applaud the work that Mr. Livingston and Mr. Cardin have done. Uh, I think it's, it's a very significant matter, and, and I'm pleased that we're going to be able to vote on this matter uh, hopefully tomorrow. Uh, and I would lastly share Mr. Menendez's uh, request that, that any issues of, of germaneness be looked at in the context of what we're trying to do uh, in the underlying uh, issue before us today, and that is to improve the integrity of this House. This matter is before you uh, in exactly the same spirit, and that is to improve the integrity of this House. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, I, I couldn't be more grateful to uh, uh, co-sponsor this amendment with Mr. Menendez and uh, Mr. Barrett. Uh, and I believe it is not a, an issue about one individual. Uh, it's an issue about the ethical process and standards of the House of Representatives. Uh, I pray that we realize that just as we can't allow individuals to be lobbyists, former members to be lobbyists representing clients on the floor of the House for the obvious reason, and really don't allow them to be on the House floor so there's not even a question about it, that we would recognize that if they have a personal reason to be before the House uh, and to have us be considered issues, that they should not be on the House floor as former mem members. It seems like, uh, frankly, a no-brainer for me, uh, but I just want to emphasize this is sometimes a particular incident, a particular issue can bring it to our attention that we need to take action, but you don't pass a law on a particular, about a particular person, a particular issue, and I believe the sincerity of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle in bringing this forward to improve the process for all of us and not to have it focus on one individual is, is there, and I sincerely hope that we realize this is a bipartisan amendment that deserves uh, the support unanimously of the House. Thank you. Chris, thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much. Um, let me just say that um, <coughs> it's my understanding that under, uh, under the rules uh, that members uh, should not be able to lobby on the floor. Uh, there are questions, uh, and it's a little gray, uh, but um, it does not speak to the particular problem that you're, that you're concerned with. Uh, however, your amendment uh, is not germane to this issue. And uh, I don't believe that we could uh, we could support it. I know where you're coming from. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was involved on the floor, Mr. Menendez, when you were earlier today, and, uh, and tried to make sure that uh, uh, even though I didn't believe that lobbying was taking place, uh, that it shouldn't even be perceived as being taking place and, uh, and uh, tried to take care of it. Uh, but uh, we understand where you're coming from. If we do not uh, make your amendment in order today, 
uh, under the new uh, rules packages that we might uh, be considering. We will certainly put that in the mix, and um, perhaps it needs needs to be considered. Mr. Chairman, if I may, Mr. very briefly. Uh, first of all, I appreciate your comments. Let me just say I want to join Crichet's comments in that. I offer this, as you know, from the filings of the committee before any of today's incidents. Yes, this is not about an individual. It goes to the integrity of the House. Uh, my example, if a former member had legal fees pending before the House, would it be proper to have he or she on the House floor trying to lobby us to get the votes necessary to pass their legal fees? I don't think any of us want to be placed in that situation. I don't think we want to place this institution in that situation. And while there may be a question of germaneness, this committee has extraordinary powers. Uh, and in that respect, uh, as someone who uh, co-sponsored the, the flag amendment with you and was a vocal uh, uh, advocate of it. Let me just say why I did that is because I believe in the very principles of what it stood for. And what it stands for is part of the symbol to the rest of the world is the democracy that we have in this House. And what we show the rest of the world is, is the democratic process. I believe that the committee has the power to do this. And the context in which I'm asking and my colleagues are asking to do it is an appropriate context and would send the right message at a time that we're trying to build the integrity of the House back back in the minds of the American people. So this is beyond an individual, and I would pursue this in, in, throughout this Congress if the committee doesn't see it appropriate to provide the amendment, and in the next Congress, because I believe it is something that needs to be addressed. But I thank you for Would the your chairman question. entertain an additional comment? <coughs> Mr. Chase. Just very briefly, I would make a, a, a request to the, to the chairman uh, that he contact the leadership um, uh, uh, the Republican leadership to see, uh, given that this is a relatively new issue and one in which I think many members might want to address, uh, that they consider encouraging this committee to make this uh, amendment in order. Uh, I, this isn't going to go away. It's going to get worse. And I think the sooner we nip it in the bud and deal with it, the better it will be for everyone, Republican and Democrat. <clears throat> we appreciate your gentleman coming before us, and uh, we will certainly take your views into consideration. Mr. Moakley, you have any questions? No questions? Any questions of the witness? If not, gentlemen, thank you very, very thank much you. for coming. The, uh, I think we have one last witness scheduled, and that uh, gentleman's waiting patiently, uh, Mr. John Hostetler of uh, Indiana. And, uh, Congressman, if you'd come forward, uh, your entire statement will appear in the record without objection, but feel free to take whatever time you feel necessary. Turn on your mic. With the red light on right. uh, for this uh, opportunity to speak to you about what may be considered to be a, an unusual uh, subject, uh, one that the parliamentarian says that there may be a problem of germaneness, but uh, I think this discussion that we've had today highlights uh, the point, a point that I would like to make. The chairman and several members of the committee and uh, witnesses have cited the Constitution time and time again, and I think that, the, that while my name is the only name on the amendment, that this is not an, a partisan issue. Uh, I would like to explain to the committee what has happened most recently with my situation a, uh, that has brought this to the attention. Uh, this issue, I think, is, is important to the discussion of, of what we're talking about here and what we do as a House on the floor. Earlier this month, I was uh, contacted by the uh, rules uh, by the, excuse me, by the Ethics Committee and uh, was uh, uh, told that I would not be able to uh, initiate a constitution project in my district as a result of the rules of the House as they are today. Uh, there was much uh, action that was taking, part on the part of, uh, taking place on the part of my office because we want to uh, have the opportunity to expose young people, especially high school students, to the United States Constitution and to encourage them to read it deliberate on it and to, uh, and to uh, uh, make it a part of their daily life and understand the importance of it. However, uh, the, the, as a result of some of the uh, parts of the, the Constitution uh, project, uh, part of the provisions of that, uh, the, the committee said that they would not be able to uh, endorse and, and allow me to uh, continue on with this project, and so the project has come to uh, a standstill in the committee. I think the committee has been given a rationale for my amendment, and while I, I believe that I understand that there is a problem with germaneness, I think that given the fact that today is the 210th anniversary of the ratification of the United States Constitution and the Con Constitution Convention, it is a time when we should be uh, 
uh, upholding our, our oath to support and defend the Constitution, to allow members to take a very active part in, in uh, putting forth the merits of studying the Constitution, understanding it, and applying it in their daily life. I would say that I would ask the committee to have this amendment made in order. However, as a result of discussions that I have had with, uh, uh, with Chairman Livingston and Ranking Member Cardin on the uh, task force, they said that they'd already put their manager's amendment, uh, completed action on that. I was trying to get this in the manager's amendment. Both of those gentlemen felt that they were uh, in accordance uh, with my uh, intent on this amendment, but, and, uh, chair, and uh, Congressman Cardin graciously said that he would work with the chairman and ranking member on this uh, issue to try, try to get that decision uh, turned around. But if the rule, the uh, letter of the rule of the House does not allow that to happen, then I would ask that the, the committee would allow for this amendment to be made in order so that members can uh, treat the Constitution the same way we, for example, treat uh, the arts in, in this House. This, this type of provision is not without, is not without precedent. The arts competition allows for uh, the private sector to uh, finance uh, awards and other things to, to, uh, uh, to herald the, the merit of the arts, and I think that we need to do the same thing for the Constitution. <coughs> What is it that you are that you are attempting to do that you are being told you can't do? Well, okay. Yes, and sir. is it with, with, in other words, uh, when you have copies of the Constitution, where did you get them? Is that a, is that a government publication? The, the, the copies of the Constitution we are going to be asked to be put together by uh, two uh, nonpartisan groups in Indiana uh, that, uh, because we wish to put the United States Constitution with the Declaration and the Indiana State Constitution in one document a document that has not been created. They have graciously said that they would finance that. And, uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, the Franking Commission said that, this, that a, a copy of that was given to them. They said it was frankable. But the uh, Ethics Committee said that that could not be put out uh, as, part of this, as part of this competition. And uh, so that, that is what I wish to, to change part of the, the idea. But simply to say that, that nothing in the rules would prohibit a member from uh, using official sources or nonpartisan sources to uh, create a create a, uh, a forum for the exposure of young people to the Constitution. Mr. Dry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd simply like to congratulate you, John, and of course the the vision of this Rules Committee for holding this hearing at which your amendment was be able, being able to be offered, and that is today is September 17th. 1997, the 210th anniversary of the signing of the U.S. Constitution. And uh, I think that your idea is uh, very timely, to say the least, and uh, worthy of uh, consideration here. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Moakley, do you have any questions? No, I, I don't have any questions. <laughs> John, I don't know that we're going to be able to help you because uh, there are uh, other non-germane amendments that uh, have been asked for. And uh, as much as I would like to, because I very am, am very much concerned uh, that there is even a question about this. And I'd like to further look into it and, uh, and see if we couldn't resolve it anyway. But uh, uh, one way or the other, we appreciate your coming before us, and we'll certainly try to help you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank Any you. Any other further questions of the witness? If not, uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, this concludes the... Uh, yep. This concludes the... Uh, uh, hearing portion of our amendment. We're going to stand in recess for uh, just two or three minutes, uh, subject to the call of the chair. Take a seat. Oh, all right. <coughs> Mr. Slaughter wants to follow. Okay. Microphone, please.
I can offer my motion here. Can I? Well, why don't we just? Committee will come back to order. Committee will come back to order. Need for us now. The the pending legislation uh, is the uh, ethics reform package before us. Uh, the chair would be in receipt of a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant the resolution HRES 168 to implement the recommendations of the bipartisan health ethics reform task force. A modified closed rule providing one hour of general debate divided equally between Representative Livingston and Representative Cardin. The rule provides that no amendments will be in order except those printed in the Rules Committee report, which may be considered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, will be debatable for the time specified in the report, and will not be subject to amendment. Finally, the rule provides for one motion to recommit. You've heard the uh, motion by the gentleman from California, Mr. Dreyer. Uh, let me again point out that uh, during the, uh, the hearing, uh, the chairman of the committee had uh, said that it was the intention of the committee not to make in order partisan amendments, that we would only uh, consider those that had bipartisan support uh, and those that uh, were of particular concern to members on both sides of the aisle. We have done just that uh, in making a manager's amendment, which is bipartisan, uh, in order, along with uh, an amendment by Congressman Murtha uh, and Tauzin, another by Congressman Tauzin and Murtha, and finally uh, one by Bunning and one by Abercrombie uh, for a total of four amendments. Uh, is there any discussion or amendment there, too? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Moakley. I have an amendment to the rule. I move that the committee grant H. Res. 168 a mod modified closed rule that would make an order only an amendment if offered by the co-chairs of the task force, Representative Cardin and Representative Livingston. This task force met nearly every day for three months to reach a truly bipartisan agreement on this very sensitive and difficult matter. At that time, many of us from both sides of the aisle had items that we thought would improve the final version of the resolution. However, we realized that any further change you would turn your seriously... Off, Joe. However, we realized that any further change would seriously compromise this bipartisan agreement. So we agreed not to amend the package any further unless it was agreed to or offered by both co-chairs Cardin and Livingston. I think members should have the opportunity to vote up or down on the bipartisan's <laughs> task force recommendation. And I think to open this resolution to the amendment at this point would effectively kill a truly bipartisan agreement that took many months of hard work to reach. <clears throat> well, Mr. Moakley, in uh, arguing against your, uh, your amendment, um, we, as you know, had taken this back to the uh, c caucuses of each uh, political party. Uh, I think Mr. Cardin took it to your Democrat Party and Mr. Uh, uh, Livingston took it to our Republican Party. And uh, both, uh, in both uh, caucuses, there was considerable uh, discussion about uh, the package. And uh, there were members on both sides of the aisle uh, that wanted to uh, at least have an opportunity to debate these particular issues on the floor. And uh, I believe that we owe it to the, uh, to the membership to, uh, to let them uh, at least dis to discuss them. If uh, in the infinite wisdom of the uh, full uh, uh, body, uh, 435 members, if they, uh, they don't uh, believe that these amendments should be made in order, uh, I'm sure they will vote them down. And uh, I have no idea how the outcome will be, but uh, I would insist that uh, we at least give the, the members that opportunity. And therefore, I would urge defeat of your amendment. If there is no further discussion of the gentleman's amendment, uh, all those in favor of the Moakley Amendment say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. No. Nay. And the amendment is not agreed roll to. Roll call, Mr. Chairman. A roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Uh, Mr. Dreyer? No. Mr. Dreyer votes no. Mr. Goss? Mr. Linder? Ms. Price? Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> the clerk will announce the results. We're not finished. 
All right. Okay. But I know she didn't accept uh, that one, and I. If we could go back to regular order, I would uh, right. ask the clerk to announce the uh, results, and then we can discuss others if you if you okay. care to. Three days, five days. And the amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments or uh, discussion of He's the, uh, the amendment. package? Dry is going to offer the amendment. Oh, oh, sorry. Change plans. Okay. If there uh, are. Uh, I would like to uh, make an amendment that we strike all after the resolving clause and insert in lieu thereof the following resolved that upon the adoption of this resolution, it shall be in order to consider in the House the resolution HRS 168 to implement the recommendations of the bipartisan House Ethics Reform Task Force. The resolution shall be considered as read for amendment. The previous question shall be considered as ordered on the resolution and any amendment thereto to final passage without intervening motion or demand for division of the question except one, one hour of debate on the resolution which shall be equally divided and controlled by the chairman and ranking member of the minority, uh, member of the committee on rules or two, one motion to amend by Representative Livingston of Louisiana with the concurrence of Representative Cardin of Maryland which shall be in order without intervention of any point of order or demand for division of the question shall be considered as read and shall be separately debatable for 30 minutes, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and the proponent and one motion to recommit. I liked it so much when Mr. Mokley did it that I thought if we actually, would repeat it, actually, maybe we could change a vote. Actually, I'd like to recall my vote and vote on Louise's. All right. Uh, well, I would object to recalling your vote. Uh, uh, that vote would have to stand, but uh, if the gentlelady uh, uh, I could say, if I may, just for yes, the record, sir. since I General, General my recognized. amendment, but I would like to say that I, I want to express my own personal disappointment uh, that these amendments were allowed. I thought that we made it very clear that all of us were extremely proud of the product and loved the bipartisanship of it, and I think it ill behooves us considering that now to mess around with it. Uh, and I would much have preferred it as the document was written as it stood. Thank the gentlelady for his co her comments. Um, are there further uh, comments or amendments uh, to the uh, resolution? If not, the chair would put the question. All those in favor of reporting the resolution will say aye. aye. All those opposed, nay. No. And the resolution is reported. Roll call, Mr. Chairman. And a roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Uh, Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Dreyer votes aye. Mr. Goss. Mr. Linder. Ms. Price. Mr. diaz Bellard. Yes. Mr. diaz Bellard votes yes. Mr. McGinnis. McGinnis votes yes. Mr. Hastings. Aye. No. Uh, yes. And the clerk will announce the results. And uh, th this resolution, uh, which uh, does allow the House to work its will, uh, is uh, reported, and Mr. Solomon, the chairman, will carry for the majority. And Mr. Mokley. The ranking minority member will carry it for the committee. Well, and, uh, and Joe, I, uh, I, let me just say, I hope you're the ranking minority member for many years to come. No, I don't think so. <laughs> and uh, that's the only business to come before the body. There is a possibility that if the uh, census problem is worked out with the administration, with the White House, that we could be meeting about 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Uh, however, I would just uh, make mention, this is the only business that will be on the floor tomorrow. Uh, and because of the limited number of amendments that were made in order, we should be done with this by 1.30 or so, and I would hope that the members would wait around just in case we do have to have a rules meeting later on in the afternoon. And I thank those of you who, you were, uh, who didn't understand there was going to be a, a, a meeting later on tonight uh, for returning. Thank you very much. Okay. Meetings adjourned.
Today, the House will consider the final amendments to the...